Good evening, everyone, and welcome and thank you for joining this evening. At this time, I will call this meeting of the Hampton City School Board of December 2nd to order. Ms. Bowers, would you please call the roll? Ms. Safanja? Here. Ms. Banks Gray? Here. Ms. Cherry? Here. Dr. Mason? Here. Mr. Samuels? Present. Dr. Woodhouse? Here. Mr. Kilgore. Here. Let the record show that all board members are present this evening. Our next item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Actually, it's uh, item 1.02. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I motion that we approve tonight's agenda. Second. I have a motion from Ms. Jackson Afonja and a second from Ms. Banks Gray. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Bowers, would you please call for the vote? Ms. Afonja? Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Ms. Cherry? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. The motion passes. Uh, the next thing on our agenda is recognitions. This evening we have uh, four recognitions. Um, the school board has the honor of recognizing four individuals this evening for their dedication and service to the Hampton City School Board. Uh, with us tonight is Joseph Bowers, our alternate to the student representative for the 2019-2020 school year, Paul Karnick, our current student representative, but also serves as the student, as the student representative for the 2019-2020 school year. Unfortunately, Ms. Uh, Smith could not be with us, but she did serve as the interim school board member from January 20 to June 20. And Ms. Phyllis Henry, past school board member who served the student staff, family, and Hampton community from 2004 to 2020. I'd like to begin by recognizing Joseph Bowers. As I share, Joey served as the alternate to the student representative during the 2019-2020 school year. Last year, Joey was a senior at Phoebus High School. During his academic career at Phoebus, he was a member of the Marine Corps JROTC and served as the battalion commander during the 2018, 2019, and 2019, 2020 school years. He was a member of the junior ROTC drill team and color guard, the National Honor Society and the National English Honor Society. In his spare time, and I say spare time lightly, lightheartedly, Joey volunteered at Bay Beagle Rescue, the Arthritis Foundation, and Armstrong School for the Arts. In addition, he served guest during a night's welcome through the Hampton Mechanical and Lodging Provisions Help Program and participated in the Wreaths Across America Program annually at Arlington Cemetery. And a large congratulation to Joey who just finished his first semester at Virginia Tech, where he was part of the Corps of Cadets. Joey, I'd like to thank you for your time and dedication last year as you represented the voice of Hampton students and on behalf of the school board, please accept this plaque of recognition. And as you can see on the screen, actually visited uh, Joey at home yesterday uh, to present him the plaque. Our next recognition is Paul Karnak. Paul is currently our 2020-2021 student representative. However, he started in this position last year with Joey in July of 2019. Since he was unable to complete his term due to the, our shutdown in the spring, the board asked Paul to stay on for an additional year as our student representative. Paul is currently a senior and an international baccalaureate student at Hampton High School. 
He is a member of the Hampton High School Marching Band, Jazz Band, and Symphonic Band, the Varsity Track and Field Team, National Honor Society, and Mu Alpha Theta Math Honor Society. He previously served as a junior class officer and a sophomore class officer. Paul volunteers through the IB program CAS, which stands for Creativity, Activity, and Service Hours, with organizations such as the Salvation Army and Go Rescue Adopt Center, and has served as an Academies of Hampton student ambassador for three years. In addition, he attended a summer residential governor school program during the summer of 2019. Paul, thank you for your service last year, last school year, and this current school year. Even though the student representative plays a non-voting role on the school board, the position is an important role as you represent your peers during board discussions on issues and policies that directly affect the student body. So on behalf of the board, please accept this plaque of recognition. And before moving on to our next honorees, I'd like to provide Joey and Paul a moment to say a few words and I will start with Mr. Bowers. Mr. Bowers. Thank you, Mr. Kilgore. Uh, just real quickly, I wanna say um, uh, thank you to uh, um, the board for allowing me the opportunity um, to be a student representative last year. Um, it was a great experience and uh, I wish Paul and all of you and Sam State Schools in general, um, uh, the best of luck for uh, the rest of this year as y'all um, figure out this challenging time right now. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Joey. And now, Mr. Carnick, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, you know, I'm very glad to be honored tonight. I, uh, one of my uh, biggest attitudes toward this role is that I treat it as a full-time job. Uh, and it's, it, it is, I'm a full-time student. So as the student representative, I am always uh, looking to make sure uh, students are delivered equity from the school division, justice on the school, on the part of the school division, and uh, that we, we as a division truly are living up to our motto, every child, every day, whatever it takes. And although uh, there have been some atypical circumstances since I have come on the board, uh, you, you know, I cherish this time that I have uh, with each and every one of you. Uh, and this has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. So thank you. I wish you all the best of luck. And I wish uh, uh, Mr. Bowers the best wishes as he continues his service as a member of the Virginia Tech Corps Cadets and his studies at Virginia Tech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. At this time, would other board members like to provide any comments to our student representatives? All right. If not, I will move on to um, our next recognition. And although, again, Ms. Smith is not here, um, I'd like to just uh, say a few words. Um, as you recall, last year, Ms. Martha Mugler resigned from the school board on December 31st of 2019 to serve as the 91st district delegate in the Virginia General Assembly. We were thrilled for Martha but with her departure, the board had a vacancy to fill. We were fortunate enough to have Monica Smith as one of the individuals who was willing and interested in filling the seat. In January of 2020, the board appointed Monica to hold the seat until June 2020. Even though it was only for five months, Monica came to the board with experience and valuable insight. She served on the Hampton School Board from 2012 to 2016 and was the president of the Hampton Council of PTAs from May of 2007 to May of 2011. She is an active volunteer in the community, is on the development committee and heads the data committee for the Downtown Hampton Child Development Center and serves as the cha grant chairperson for the Hampton Education Foundation. In those five months, Monica assisted in approving the 2020-2021 budget and navigated through the new coronavirus. On behalf of the board, 
We thank Ms. Smith for her willingness to fill Martha's vacancy and once again be a valued member of our team. Gave her a certificate um, and thanked her for her service to students, family, staff, and the Hampton community. So again, thank you, Ms. Smith. Our final recognition this evening is Ms. Phyllis Henry. It is an absolute honor to recognize Ms. Henry for her 16 years of service to the Hampton City School Board. Ms. Henry came to the board in 2004 and served four terms until June of 2020. During her tenure, she was vice chair during the 2008-2009 school year. Her level of expertise as a retired high school principal, Phoebus High School to be exact, allowed her to ask hard questions and help set important priorities for the school system. Ms. Henry was a valuable member of the board who played a vital role in many accomplishments from hiring two outstanding superintendents to expanding the school bus fleet. Her experience with tech prep and other academic teaming provided a valuable perspective regarding the division's efforts around the academies of Hampton and the portrait of a Hampton graduate. In addition, she served with the division when, when it went from 41% of our schools being fully accredited to 100% of our schools being fully accredited without condition and our dropout rate being lowest of the 15 school divisions in our region. Her passion and commitment to every student, every school and every family in Hampton City Schools was unwavering. She was a respected and valued member of this board. On behalf of the board, we thank you for your dedication to the board and to Hampton administration and staff, our students, family, and the community at large. We'd like to show our appreciation with this plaque, which reads, in honor of Phyllis Taylor Henry for leadership and commitment to Phoebus High School for 18 years and her service on the Hampton School Board for 16 years. Not only is this plaque being presented to Ms. Henry, but an additional plaque will be provided to Phoebus High School to hang in their building in recognition of her service. So let's give Ms. Henry a round of applause. And I invite Ms. Henry at this time, if you would like to make any comments. It's, you're on you're on mute, Miss Henry. Not anymore. Um, I, I thank you all very much. Um, it's it's very special that that plaque will be at Phoebus High School for me. Um, I didn't realize when I came to Hampton to teach at Pembroke High School in 1968, which is a long time ago, that I would spend over 45 years involved with the the division. 30 years as a teacher and an administrator and 16 years on the board. I have to say, I loved every minute of it. Um, when I first went to Pembroke, the uh, senior class from Phoenix High School welcomed us to their school. That was the beginning of a wonderful experience. Uh, all through those years, I enjoyed the wonderful staff I worked with. Hampton, if you have not taught in another division or not served in another division, you don't realize what a special place, and I have in two other divisions, what a special place Hampton is, how much the teachers uh, care about their students, how much they work together. I work for some wonderful principals who taught me how to do the job right and a couple that showed me how I didn't want to do it. Uh, but I it just had a wonderful experience all along and the thing you must have to be, as a 70 plus year old, I have to give you advice. Um, don't take for granted the, th the other wonderful thing we have in Hampton, which is community support. Wonderful, wonderful support. You cannot ask anybody in this community for something for Hampton City Schools that they won't do it for you. So don't ever um, underestimate the power you have in asking and employing the wonderful community support you have. 
the wonderful parents we have, and the students. I had the biggest thrill today. I had a phone call from a student who was at Phoebus 33 years ago, and he called to tell me what he's up to now, and um, we just had a lovely conversation. He, he, 33 years ago, asked me an important question. He said, Ms. Henry, why are there no students in AP history that look like me, this African-American student? who happened to be the commander of the ROTC. I changed some things about how students got into AP history, after AP courses after that. So I have some advice for you as you go forward and had, wish you nothing but the best success. You're a wonderful folks and I enjoyed working with all the members of the board and, and some dear friends who aren't there anymore like um, Butch Harper and Henry Godfrey who were dear friends and, and gave me wonderful advice and good common sense all the time. Always remember that you're all there for the same reason. You all have each other to rely on. There's always more than one right answer. And the best way to get to the best answer is to listen to each other's right answer. And you'll come out with the best solution. And when in doubt, don't listen to each other. Ask a student. Students always come up with the best solutions. So I wish you everything best in this very difficult time. I'm so proud of the way that Hampton has arranged everything so that if our community will get it straight and wear their masks and get the, the rate down in the community, we will be able to open school, I'm confident, with no difficulties at all because it's so well planned out and well thought out and, and you and the superintendent have uh, take a lot of credit for that. So thank you so much for th for this evening and I wish you nothing but the best. I know everything is going to continue to go well for you. Thank you very much, Ms. Henry. Um, at this time, would any board members like to make any comments? All right. Well, Ms. Henry, this is the first time I'll, I'll say that you don't have to stay for the rest of the meeting if you don't want to. I have a Carolina basketball game to watch. You okay. know that. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you again for your service. Good evening. All right. At this time, we move on to our consent agenda. The consent agenda consists of uh, item 3.01, personnel report number 20-17, item 3.02, minutes of the school board meeting of October 21st, 2020, Item 3.03, .03, minutes of the special meeting of October 27th, 2021, 2020. Item 3.04, minutes of the school board meeting of November 4th, 2020. Item 3.05, minutes of the minutes of the governance training of November 10th, 2020. Item 3.06, minutes of the school board meeting of November 12th, 2020, which was our community priorities workshop. And item 3.07 release from compulsory attendance slash religious exemption. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move that we approve the consent agenda. I have a motion, do I have a second? Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion from Ms. Jackson Afonja and a second from Dr. Mason. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Byers, please call for the vote. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Ms. Cherry? Aye. Dr. Mason? Aye. Mr. Samuels? Aye. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Afonja? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye, the motion carries. Our next section of the agenda is the superintendent and staff reports. I will turn it over to Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the school board. Uh, we'll start with uh, the climate and culture um, report, uh, building positive relationships and uh, certainly the work that we know that we have going on in our schools. Um, we'll start with Ms. Hatcher and I know that uh, she will be joined by Ms. Heather Peterson uh, this evening. So let me turn it over to Ms. Hatcher. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Kilgore, Vice Chair Woodhouse, members of the board, Dr. Smith, and our Hampton City Schools family. I am driving the presentation tonight, Ms. Bowers, um, and just checking to make sure if you can see my screen. 
Not yet. There we go. <laughs> All right. I will keep driving. I'm excited to be here tonight and share just some refinement of the work. You'll hear tonight a little bit about social emotional learning and where we are with that work, how we're continuing to support our schools and all of our departments in the climate work. You'll hear about our intentional focus on equity and on self-care, very important during this time of turmoil. And you'll hear about our next steps as we move and forward. Our Hampton City Schools. Even though this work is highlighted tonight by Ms. Peterson, our Director of Climate and Culture, and by me, we're happy to be here, but this work is the work of every staff member and our students and our families. So that's really where the magic happens in our buildings and our apartments and in our children, with our children and in their homes. And so we are just here tonight to share the highlights of that. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Peterson who will dive into some of that magic and tell you how it's going. Thank you, Ms. Hatcher. As always, excited to be here with you all tonight. Um, a big, huge foundational piece of the work we do, as you all know, is in social emotional learning. And I wanted us to jump off here tonight. Um, CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning, who provides us with so much great research and also our definition that we use in Hampton City Schools, in this past year has updated their definition. And so just wanted to make you aware of that, some really great components that they've added in. Not only are we building on knowledge and skills, but we're also trying to impact both adults and young people's attitudes, helping them to identify those healthy identities. Um, we wanna have collective goals, not just personal goals, but when we think about this notion of coming together in community. And I love that last one there. Not only do we wanna make responsible decisions, but we want to make caring decisions. So again, as we move this work forward in our division, um, on the next slide, you'll see we are actually in year three um, of our plan. And so just wanting to kind of update you of where we are. Again, when we talk about the refinement piece is actually where we are. We were really intentional about marrying the work of climate and culture with social emotional learning. Um, we were here a year ago with you unpacking where we were with year two. And now as we look at year three, Again, some of those big highlights, as Ms. Hatcher mentioned, we're going to be focusing on equity and how we use social emotional learning to support that. Again, being in year three, we've really embraced this as a division um, and as a champion when we look across not only our state, but our country in this work, um, continuing to embed this work in our curriculum. Um, we hope by the end of this year to adopt some standards um, to, to be able to drive this work. Um, and one of the things we're most excited about is we're going to begin to have our young people in grades three through 12 be able to provide some self-assessment of where they see themselves in these skills. That'll give us some really rich data to begin to create some measurable outcomes and also some interventions for young people. So we were moving right along, January and February came and boom, a storm hit. And this storm that we were all in the middle of. Um, and, and again, when we think about this storm, one of the things that you all sitting here tonight were impacted, our students, our families, um, um, and, and certainly our community as a whole. And one of the things when we look ahead that we talked about is that while we were all in this same storm, we had to ride it out um, in different boats, right? Again, we were all experiencing the same storm and still are in the middle of it, if we will, but not everybody was riding it out in the same boat. So very quickly as a climate and culture team, one of the things that we recognized really quickly um, as we look ahead is that we had to anchor our actions in what we knew mattered most, which is climate and culture. And so as we looked ahead to how we pivoted, there was some research that came out on these next couple slides that we'll share with you is that one of the things Dr. Smith so eloquently shared several years ago is that climate and culture is equally as important as academic achievement. And what we've adopted as a division is to actually say that climate and culture is the plate that everything sits on. A lot of times climate and culture becomes a side dish and pushed to the side, but what we've been bold as a division to say is no, it's the foundation. And back in May, as we were in the midst of this virtual learning and so much uncertainty, it felt like so much, like this young lady holding a tray up. But what we recognized in Hampton City Schools, that climate is the plate that everything sits on. And so again, in this next slide with May, um, this, this research came out that said, how do you foster this in a positive 
how do you po sorry foster a positive school climate in a virtual world? Well, I would argue all of these things that you see up there, that physical and emotional safety, supportive teaching practices, that sense of community, and finally, that systemic integration of social emotional learning, these are all true whether we're face-to-face -face or virtual. So Hampton City Schools was poised to be able to still support this work. The work that we've been doing around climate and culture and social emotional learning wasn't a response to being in virtual learning. It was part of the work we were already doing. So with that end in mind, as we looked ahead to some things we wanted to do, these are the things that we've often reminded our teachers and staff that get poured into a positive climate and culture. And what we laid on top of this work when we started to look at what's re-entry really going to look like for young people, whether that's in a virtual space or in a face-to-face -face space, on that next slide, we added what we call the three C's. So not only did we want relationships, engagement, and expectations, but what we really asked our staff to focus on, how can we create community for our families and our students? How can we even in the Brady Bunch squares, as I like to call them, create this sense of connection? And certainly in a space where a lot of us were feeling inconsistency, how can we create consistency? So what you'll see on this next slide are some things that we pivoted to thinking about here we are in two pathways. First, we were in a face-to-face -face space that we quickly, you know, in March, mid-March, jumped to this virtual space. And then over the summer, as we were preparing, we didn't know necessarily which pathway we would go down. But what we thought about, when you look on the next slide, are some ways, how can we, from a climate and culture standpoint, equip and support our staff? So the things you see over on the left side, by March 23rd, so a week with us going into virtual, we started to provide a social emotional learning tip of the day, a self-care tip of the day. And I'm sure so many of you saw there at the bottom our Feel Good Fridays, and that was a collaboration with the amazingly talented Jen Lockett of how we could highlight and use all the great things people were posting on social media. So that's how we sustained ourselves as we moved into spring break. Then what we did is what you see on the right hand side. We started providing midweek motivations that some of you may have even noticed one that came out today. So we try to just recognize that in this space people need pick me ups and that's what midweek motivation is all about. And now we provide sell tips of the week. So those are just in time strategies that teachers can easily implement things that are already created for them. And then what you see in the center there is of course, all summer long, we provided professional learning opportunities. We provided over 19 different sessions around social emotional learning specific to our students and what they might be experiencing and how we welcome them back. So moving ahead, this summer, what we introduced, keeping our work of social emotional learning in the forefront, are the three key signature practices, all research-based, going back to divisions who had started implementing this work in 2011. So we provided and shared these three strategies with our staff, as well as electronic resources for them to be able to use. Along with these strategies, what we also did, as you look ahead on the next slide, is we upgraded our social emotional learning toolkit. This is the Hampton City Schools resource for our teachers. As you look at this screenshot, what you see are the five social emotional learning competencies. And then also you can select resources based on levels. We wanted to make it a one-stop shop to make it really easy for our teachers to access with activities they could implement immediately. So if you look at the next couple slides, it shows you, again, it's on our Hampton City Schools website and you access it through the staff page. When the staff page comes up, we have actually the social emotional learning component. So again, just a at your fingertips resource for our staff. So again, here we are, year three, moving forward in our, in our you know, rotating three-year plan, excited about the opportunities that we have, looking ahead. And again, as you see at the very top of this plan for year three is really our focus on equity. So with that being said, one of the things as we look ahead is that how do we ensure equity as a division, knowing that that is something that is a commitment for every single person that's part of Hampton City Schools, we decided to say, how do we tackle this work in a collaborative manner? So one of the things that we thought we would do is just like we embrace professional learning communities here in Hampton City Schools, if we're going to do this work, we didn't want to make it a committee. 
We didn't want to make it a task force. We didn't want to make it something that would dissolve because the work of equity is never ending. So what we created is an equity collaborative learning team. And it's a diverse cross-functional team of HCS staff members who work together to design a systems approach so that we can ensure equity for our entire community. And on the next slide, you'll see some of the members, or I'm sorry, all of the members of our CLT, which when we think about this work of equity, it includes everyone from community members to families, to staff and to students. This is a group that steers that work. We will be involving the voices of many as we continue to grow this work. But as you look at this snapshot of who's involved, we have curriculum folks involved, we have administrators, folks who represent our families, folks from a counseling background. So we tried to take a wide range of differing folks to be part of this conversation. And when we talk about the work that we're focused on, there's four key areas that we've unpacked we started meeting back in May, and these are the four big pillars, commitments, if you will, that we as a division feel like can move this work forward. You see at the top, those two that we've already been committed to around those safe and nurturing learning environments and the social emotional learning. And we will continue to push in the work of those culturally responsive practices, not only for adults, but our young people as well. And then how do we come together to focus on how we heal trauma and we also address racial injustices. So we're excited about this work and I'm gonna turn it over to, Dr. to Ms. Hatcher to finish telling you where we are with this work. Thank you. And because this isn't new work, it is an intentional look at, there are already some activities that are completed and ongoing. And so we just summarized these on this slide for you. All of our curriculum departments are focused on making sure that the learning in each classroom is relevant and culturally responsible. But here we highlight you for you the language arts and math um, areas and how they've really supported that work and our members of the team are reflective in our conversations with the group. Also, we talked to you with you in the fall about Rejuvenate to Go, which is our annual conference put on by our own HCS teachers and staff. Ms. Peterson leads that work and this year not only transitioning to a virtual conference, they were able to have 20 sessions focused on cultural responsive practices, trauma-informed care, and you'll see some of the other topics that really spoke to the times that we were going through and um, provided for our staff and hopefully benefited our staff. We also know that this work is big, ongoing, and so we have divided into some focus area groups that you will see there so that people's passions and talents, can we can put them right to work and get this work done together. We know, again, this work continues, and we know that there are systems and structures needed to support this work, some we need to create and some we need to refine. We know that we need a strategic plan, just like you see us going back to the plan for socio-emotional learning and for our culture climate work. We know that plan will keep us on track and it will also offer us an opportunity to create those measurable outcomes that can drive the work and give feedback to our stakeholders. We also know that really, if we want to know about diversity and the life experiences of our students and staff, we have to hear that voice directly. So we will be creating opportunities for those focus groups for students and staff to gather more insights and ideas as we move forward. The last topic that we have taken an intentional look this year, again, not new, but a very timely um, area is self-care. And so self-care really is Defined whenever we decide to take an intentional look at something, we want to create a common definition. So this is the English Oxford definition, a practice of taking an active role in protecting one's own well-being. And it's really important at this time going through that storm that you heard about. Former First Lady Michelle Obama speaks and her definition says we need to do a better job of putting ourselves at the top of our own to-do list. Um, this year, many of our educators and our students and our families, our to-do list became things that we had never done before. No one has ever done these things before. So we know that self-care and having grace for ourselves and others is extremely important. So with that goal in mind and with Dr. Smith's ideas and leadership, we wanted to create another opportunity for our staff. So in conjunction with our health services department, our um, public relations and marketing, our HR department, we decided 
to create the Be Safe, Be Well, a new weekly communication. Our goal was to provide an easy, accessible way for our staff to see reminders about health mitigation strategies, um, self-care reminders. And self-care, um, we, we wanna offer a menu because self-care for one person may not be self-care for another person. It's really about finding those activities, those people, those places, those things that refuel you. So we want to make sure that we can have those out there for people to choose from. We also know that um, to be informed, we want to make our staff aware of all the opportunities in our division and in our community that would help them focus on their own physical, emotional, and mental well being. We um, like our, our visuals to remind us of our work. And so we try to plan these activities around the stress buster wheel that was created by Dr. Nadine Burkaris, who's done a lot of work in um, the effects of trauma on the brain. She's the California Surgeon General and our climate team is a big fan. So this new communication is going out right now on Tuesdays. In our HR department, as I said, we're working with many departments in this work. In addition to um, traditional things such as our employee assistance program, our HR department has really tried to offer free self-care opportunities through this difficult time, and these will be ongoing. And this is just an example of some of the offerings that have already been made. Ms. Peterson shared with you our climate and culture um, website, focusing on the socio-emotional piece of it. You'll see here a screenshot of that website and there is an area specifically designed for self-care strategies and resources and we will continue to update those as part of our culture and climate work. So in closing just a brief overview of where we're going next with this work. We do definitely want to continue to focus on our climate coaches to train the to train and work with them and support our administrators because we know that in those buildings that is where the work happens. We want to continue to focus on those three signature practices. We also will be committed to updating our SEL toolkit to include self-care resources after winter break and some self-care for our team. We're going to implement the um, self-assessment, hopefully in second semester. Um, we are partnering with Panorama Education to create a meaningful survey so that we can target those students who do need more assistance with social emotional learning. We definitely will maintain our focus with the um, equity CLT and um, we were excited to be a part of the community priorities workshop recently and are working right now to try to get some of those community partners Im immediately involved in our work. We know we need a plan to spell that all out so that we can stay on track with that and then self care strategies and resources will continue to be a focus as we seek to help ways that our staff our students and our families can refuel. So we appreciate your support. Thank you for um, being a part of this work as well. Thank you, Ms. Hatcher and Ms. Peterson. Um, do I have any uh, comments or questions from board members? Is that, was that I you? do. Yes, Mr. Samuels. Yes, um, thank you, Joe, for, uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Kilgore, for the opportunity. I would like to make a comment to um, Ms. Peterson. Um, she mentioned um, cultural responsiveness, and I, I really admire um, that uh, implementation of, of, of this. And so, um, Ms. Peterson, can you give me uh, uh, give us an example of what the culturally cultural responsiveness looks like? So where we are with that work right now as a team is really trying to define what the common language of that really does look like and what would those practices look like for all of our stakeholders. Um, so, you know, when you look at the research, it can be anything from what's culturally relevant for all of the young people that we serve. Um, again, giving them experiences that they can connect to. Um, you know, so we have Miss uh, or Dr. Birdright, I should say, who's just been invited um, to be part of the 
Department of Education's team that's working on this work. So we're so grateful to have her on our team. So I would say we're in the early stages of, of trying to be really responsible about how we define that. And then what are the systems we want in place to put um, to make sure that we're supporting that work for all of our stakeholders. So that's definitely one of those areas that as we move forward into the second half of the year that we'll be unpacking and defining um, and, and what are the actions that go with that. And, and uh, Ms. Peterson, I am so pleased. As you know, I am, a, uh, I believe, a champion of your work. And I, am, I, I would love to be uh, a part of one of your workshops as, we, as, you're try, uh, as you continue to develop this uh, plan for the culturally responsive. I would love to participate in one of your workshops. Thank you, Mr. Samuels. Thank you, Mr. Samuels. Any other comments from board members? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Dr. Mason. Um, just want a, a quick comment. I think this is wonderful. Um, as we you know, continue as a division focusing on social emotional learning and how all of this plays a role in the success of our students, I think we are light years ahead of other school divisions as I look at some of the things that other divisions are doing, I think we're doing an awesome job. And that, that speaks to the work that, you know, Dr. Smith push, pushes forward uh, to, that, to that area. And that's definitely going to make a big difference as we continue to uh, move forward and coming out of this pandemic. So kudos to you all, um, Ms. Hatcher and um, Ms. Peterson. Great job, um, definitely a huge fan of what you guys are doing. And if there's ever anything that I can do, definitely give me a call. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Any other comments? All right, hearing none. Um, again, thank you, Ms. Hatcher and Ms. Peterson. Uh, definitely a critically important topic and it was an excellent presentation. So thank you. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the board. Um, our next presentation is um, with regards to the Hampton City Schools, uh, it is an athletic update. And um, Dr. Uh, Haynes, our executive director for school leadership will um, begin this particular presentation, provide an overview. And then he will be joined by uh, Ms. Uh, Beth Mayer, uh, who serves as our coordinator for the athletics program, as well as um, our driver's education program. So uh, Dr. Uh, Haynes. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Good evening, Chairman Kilgore, Vice Chair Woodhouse, members of the board, Dr. Smith in the Hampton community. As Ms. Peterson eloquently stated during her presentation, we continue to navigate through the storm. So certainly want to give you an update regarding our athletics and student athletes. As you all know that we have had our conditioning and we've had strong protocols and pre-screenings in place. During the conditioning period, Hampton City Schools and mitigation strategies have been followed by staff and student athletes. The mitigation protocols have been reviewed and approved by Ms. Glory Gill, our Director of Health Services for Hampton City Schools and Sentara Health. These would also be in place for the winter season and other seasons that would come in terms of competition. Ms. Mayor, our Coordinator for Athletics and Drivers Education is going to walk you through those. Then you will also hear what the specific protocols and expectations are, not only from Hampton City Schools, but from what we would expect in terms of the Peninsula District regarding competition. We will go through that and then you will get a chance to actually see the timelines and scheduling. One of the most important things you will want to see is that we have to remain flexible. You will see that there's a footnote that says we have delayed the start for winter sports competition. This timeline is also subject to change based on the status of COVID-19 and the participation of other school divisions within the Peninsula District. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Beth Mayer, our coordinator for athletics and driver's education. Good evening, thank you very much. If we could get the presentation on the screen, Ms. Bowers, and we'll go over this. Okay, you'll actually need to share it, Beth. Okay. I'll share it. Okay. I just sent it to you, Mr. Bowers. Well, 
or did you want me to pull it up? Which way works for you? And Ms. Bowers, if you'll make him a co-host. Yeah. Uh, Why don't you go ahead and pull it up since I'd have to download it first? You want to make him a co-host? Yes. He should be able to share. That sounds, that looks great. All right, if we can go to the table of contents, the next page. Um, like Dr. Haynes said, our presentation tonight will cover three areas. The first one is the screening expectations for our student athletes and the staff prior to participation in our athletics or activities. The second area is our COVID-19 protocols for our modified winter sports. We will break down each winter sport and explain how we're planning to successfully participate in the sports. And third is the timeline of the beginning of conditioning when we started to the time that competition will begin. All right. The first, our, our COVID-19 screening expectation was developed by our athletic trainers from Sentara. The expectations have been reviewed and approved by Glory Gill. Hampton City Schools are using a software program called Sportswear. And what it does is it tracks the daily screenings the athletes complete prior to participation. So in the morning, between seven and 12 in the morning, our athletes, knowing that they're going to come out and participate, they go into the, to the website of Sportswear. They answer these questions that you see, these symptoms asked by the Sportswear screening. They fill that out, they answer the other questions on the next part, and they log out. When they come to conditioning, the athletic trainer will make sure that that first screening has been completed. They'll have immediate access to the athlete's answers. It's a really a brief questionnaire, but it tells the athletic trainers exactly what they need to know. So when the athlete shows up for participation, the trainer checks to see if the athlete completed the questionnaire and if they answered yes to any of those questions. If an individual who has answered yes to any of the questions, they will be asked to leave immediately and not be able to participate. The trainer will offer guidance on follow-up care and the treatment op options. Now, after the daily screening, the trainer themselves will do their own screening. They'll do a daily temperature and they'll record the temperature and the trainer will ask several questions. Could be the same questions that we just saw or it could be different ones. And if they pass the daily screening and the athletic trainer assessment and everything is a go, they can participate that day in athletics. Well, let's talk about what happens if they do answer yes on one of those questions. If our students athletes exhibit signs or symptoms and or have the temperature be of 100.4, the athlete will be sent home and referred to a healthcare provider. Under this protocol, you're going to notice several scenarios. You'll see one that says, okay, they have signs and symptoms, but their temperature is not that high. Or the next one will be, yes, they have a temperature that high, but the signs and symptoms aren't there. So there's some different um, scenarios, as you can see, um, and that no matter what, if you show signs or symptoms, or if you have just a temperature, then you will, will not be able to participate in our activities that day. Now that's conditioning, that's tryouts, so that's practices. This is something that we do every day. The athletic directors and the athletic trainers and the principals of the schools have been fantastic about making sure that we follow this protocol and we make sure that everyone is safe out there. All student athletes that have been treated by a healthcare provider or who are monitored for COVID-19 has to be granted final clearance by their school nurse. And the school nurse will do the contract tracing contact tracing. And we'll go to our COVID protocols for our winter sports. All right, there you go. 
All right, in the second section of our presentation, we'll review the protocols for our winter sports. And as you look under basketball, you'll see the expectations we have for basketball competition. And what I did was I broke it down between facility, cheerleaders, pregame meetings, spectators, bench protocol, officials table, equipment use, and our JV teams. And you're going to look at that and you can see a lot of little, a lot of individual, no, I'm sorry, a lot of specific things that we have to think about. It may not be anything to really someone to read it, but we have to think about the very littlest thing. Um, just a couple things under facility. We're not going to use locker rooms. Um, teams will have an area to, to meet prior to the game. Um, during halftime, but in between that time, it'll all be sanitized by Dr. Bowling's group and the custodians. Um, teams are going to come dressed, ready to play the game. So they're going to walk in, they will have their uniform on, they'll go straight to the court. Um, of course, all water bottles will be, they bring their own water bottles and when they need to refill them, they sanitize first. Cheerleading has been a big issue because we, of course, we want our cheerleaders there. Um, and so I'm working with Newport News in Hampton to make sure we try to send the same amount of cheerleaders. We don't want to go too many and risk anything. But if you look at the cheerleaders, um, we are going to send them to away games. That's our, our, our hope. Um, they're allowed to use pom-poms are allowed to have signs. They will be sitting in the bleachers. They will not be on the sideline. They will not go onto the court to cheer. They're gonna be six feet away with their mask on and cheer. We want them there. We think they play an important part of the game, but to tell you the truth, the cheerleaders have a tremendous amount of restrictions. And I think it's because they're using their voice and they're trying to be very careful about that. Uh, let's see. Wrestling, well, let me go to pregame. Pregame is pretty much, you know, what, what are they going to do when they meet? You know, it's not flip the coin or anything like football, but they go in and they talk about having good sportsmanship and things like that. And it just talks about what officials are going to do and what pregame, you know, the pregame adequate etiquette. You'll see a lot more on that. We'll just keep adding it as the competition date comes up. Uh, spectators in the games, we are not going to allow spectators in the beginning of competition season. This was before the governor's uh, reduction of fans. We were at the, at the time he had said 250 and so we were still not going to have fans. But now that it's down to 25, of course we cannot have fans. And in that 25, it's very interesting that cheerleaders count as a spectator. So if we bring eight cheerleaders, that, that's part of it. Um, we're of course gonna sit, seat the fans on the opposite side of the, the team benches. Um, everybody will have a questionnaire prior to entry of the facility. If we do allow spectators at some point, which I'm hoping that things will turn around and we'll be able to go and watch our children. Um, but until then, no fans. Bench protocol, the most important thing about bench protocol is what we're going to do is every bench is gonna have someone's name on it. So if Beth Mayer sits here and I'm not a starter on the game, I'm sitting on a piece of paper that has my name on it, I have my mask on. If I get called into the game, I take my mask off, I put it on my chair. No one else shares that chair. No one, of course, shares the mask. And the person that's coming out immediately goes to the chair that has his name or her name and picks their mask up and puts it on. Trying to avoid any sort of um, touching or being around someone else's mask or anything. Um, the officials table, biggest thing there is that you're going to have only two people at, sitting at the table. You know, if you've ever been to a basketball game, sometimes there's like six or seven people there sitting. Um, but now until things get better, we'll have the official scoreboard person and we will have the official scorebook. 
So someone will be running the clock, running the score, and the other person will be doing the official scorebook. Visiting team scorebook will be away from us. Um, the next one is just equipment during the game, the sanitation of the balls and stuff. And then the junior varsity, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to bring the JV in first. They play their game. They come out. Everything gets sanitized. But then we bring the varsity team in. There won't be any contact in between them. Uh, then we go to, that's basketball. Indoor track. Currently, we have two meets at Boo Williams confirmed, and then that could change. Um, Boo will be in charge of making sure the facility is sanitized before, between, and after the event. Um, of course, masks must be worn by everyone. There will be no fans. Um, teams come to dress, there's no locker rooms. And just as far as Tampa City Schools, we're gonna to try to practice outdoors with indoor track and try to get them outside. Of course, weather sometimes doesn't allow us to do that, but at the most, we'll try to be outside. All right, wrestling. Um, the number of students that are coming out to wrestling is extremely low. Um, it's not always our biggest, biggest uh, attendance with kids, but, it's very, very low this year. And due to the nature and the full contact of athletes, the Peninsula District coaches and athletic directors are really, they really think they're very scared to try to put wrestling off the ground. Tomorrow we have a Peninsula District athletic directors meeting and we will be talking about that. They'll make a recommendation to the principals whether or not we will go through with wrestling. Um, but we have a lot of questions, but everyone around the state is having the same difficulty with wrestling. Swimming, the way they're going to do swimming is um, you go into a swim, if I'm a swimmer, I go into a, a, a pool, I get timed on my event. So if I'm doing freestyle, I get timed on my freestyle, it gets recorded and then it gets compared to the other teams or the other school teams that are in our district. There will never be a meet where everybody's coming together until COVID is done. Um, it says there's gonna be one meet. I'm hoping that there's more, um, but right now, and we'll know more tomorrow, but it's a fluid thing. It changes all the time, but at this moment, that's where we're at. We are working to try to get our swimmers to practice time. Um, right now they have to practice on their own. The YMCA in Hampton is just wonderful. And they have said that they will open their doors to individuals coming in as long as we do a reservation. So we're gonna work with the coaches and we'll make sure that those swimmers are getting some practice time. They'll, they'll go on their own and they'll swim on their own and they'll have to have someone maybe time them, but, and they won't be with their group team, but at least they'll get some practice. Uh, the transportation of the student athletes, uh, the eight bullet points here, I got straight from Darren Wools. He, this is what he expects and we will follow them to a T. This is where we started once, <laughs> August 1st is when we were supposed to start football. And I, if anyone knows me, that is my favorite time of year. I mean, I am like in a depression, but anyway. Um, so we kind of put off, we waited for the Virginia High School League to tell us what we could do and what we can't do and things like that. So we finally got to start conditioning in October, October 20th. Um, the Virginia High School League had already moved the seasons. You know, of course, we're starting winter now. And then in February, we start the fall sports. So that's when Beth will be happy again. Um, and then we will start the spring sports in April until June. Um, let's see. It kind of just kind of outlines what where we're at. Um, so we're, we're past Thanksgiving um, right now. Uh, there's no conditioning for this week because of the quarantine after spring or Christmas Thanksgiving break. Um, 
on December, which is December 7th, next Monday, our modified winter sports begin. Our basketball, our cheerleading, swimming, wrestling, indoor track, tryouts and practices. Um, during December 7th through the 19th, that's a dead period for spring and fall sports. And so, and that happens every year. That's just every, it's seasonal. So that's nothing that's because of COVID. So they will not be practicing or doing anything until January 11th. Um, January 4th, we're going to, um, we'll adjust practices as they, you know, as far as COVID and, and that might, the screening expectations might happen. Um, and then January 11th, we are going to start winter sports competition. It was supposed to begin in December, December 22nd, I believe, but we're pushing that back to January 11th. Uh, we have a 14 game schedule. We're hoping that it will affect it, us, but we're gonna work on it and everything will be okay. The kids will have time and have plenty of games to play. And that is it. Can I answer any questions? Thank you very much, Ms. Mayor and Dr. Haynes. Uh, do I have any questions from school board members? Yes, Mr. Cherry. Um, yes, I have a, a comment and then just a couple of clarifications. First of all, I wanna say um, thank you to um, Dr. Haynes and Ms. Mayor, and especially to Dr. Smith, who um, quickly had this added to the agenda for the board, because as um, I learned at the Virginia School Board Association meeting when I attended the VHSL workshop, that based on the guidelines they were looking at, we were really close to somebody bouncing a ball very quickly. And I felt that while I had um, been in charge of the athletic area when I was in Hampton City Schools, I felt that other board members also needed to be made aware of just where we stand. And Ms. Mayor and Dr. Haynes and Dr. S um, Smith have done a great job in outlining that. I'm very familiar with um, Ms. Mayor and her depression when it comes to football. Um, um, I've witnessed it for 17 years and I can say that I'm so glad Ms. Mayor that your bears were able to play because Dr. Haynes and I had discussed, we might have to put you in a home. <laughs> so uh, we're very glad that we took care of that. Um, I do want to make just a couple of clarifications um, that you and I had talked about. Um, one of the things is when our students, when they do decide we're gonna go play basketball, but thanks for moving that schedule back because it was December 22nd, they were supposed to start and we're pushing it back to January 11th, which I think is very responsible. That we're looking at Peninsula District. We're talking Newport News, Hampton and Gloucester. Yes, ma'am. That's the Peninsula District. And yes. that's what we're talking about because a question had been raised and you answered it very well, you and Dr. Smith yesterday, okay, we follow all of these wonderful guidelines, but what happens when we have to go to Southside and for instance, play a Tallwood? And the response is, we don't go to Tallwood. We just play within the Peninsula District unless we go to regional play. Can you expand on that just a titch? Sure, and that's exactly right. Uh, you know, normally, for example, let's take the football schedule. Normally I would host 20 games at Darling Stadium. This year I'm only hosting eight. Um, and those, those, opponents will only be Peninsula District. A lot of times you'll see maybe one or two games where the coach will say, hey, you know what? I know Ocean Lakes is a really good team and I wanna play them, but there's none of that this year. It's strictly Peninsula District. We're working together, the coordinator over Newport News and Gloucester, we're working together to make sure we're all following, being very consistent with our protocols, making sure everyone is safe. Now, you brought up region, yes if our teams and when our teams, because we have great teams, when our teams go to region, there's gonna be another set of protocols. We're gonna to have to work hand in hand with that school division that we're playing. And that will be coming and we will be right on top of it. And I will share that with you, but it'll be different. You know, Virginia Beach is different of course than Norfolk. So we'll just do the best we can and it won't be a lot, but it will be a little. Okay. Okay, thank you. And I want to, again, thank you all for having to try to navigate through some very difficult times to ensure that we have a successful sports program um, in light of all that's going on. 
And I think it's important that to just reemphasize that there's no locker room. So our teams, our babies come dressed, correct? When they get off the bus, they're ready to play. They are ready to play, Miss Stevens, yes. Okay. Sure. Okay. And if there's a girls game and a boys game following, could you just explain how they're going to be coming to different areas and sure. getting on different buses? Mm -hmm. Sure. You, what we what we envision, and every uh, every school is different. Of course, I mean, if you look at Phoebus and their entry points, it's different than Bethel. Right. And so, the athletic directors are going to have this is the visiting team entrance. This is the home team entrance. Nobody's going to be touch be near each other. They're going to come in. They're going to be screened. The visiting team will be screened prior to them getting on the bus, and as and then they won't be screened again, that we are going to be confident that Newport News and Gloucester are taking care of it and they are screening their kids. So then let's say the girls team plays or maybe the JV team plays. If it's a JV boys, varsity boys, could be varsity girls, JV varsity boys, it doesn't matter. But the first team that comes in, they play their game. Then they will exit immediately, no handshakes, nothing. They will go out the same door into the bus on the same seat and they will leave. And then very quickly, we'll have custodians come in and clean the uh, officials table. They'll clean the chairs. They'll make sure the floor is okay. And then we will bring in the next team. Okay. And lastly, I know you said that toward the end of the week, perhaps we would know something about wrestling. Yes. Uh, there might be a decision and then those protocols you have will be updated. Yes. on our website for that. But in the meantime, um, the example that you gave regarding swimming mm -hmm. was an excellent one in terms of swimming competition. Mm -hmm. For instance, you had talked about there won't be a group of us competing against each other in a pool. You made the um, analogy that if you are an expert uh, or your field of expertise is the breaststroke, then you go in and you are timed. And then I get called when I'm supposed to go in whatever day or whatever time. And then I do my breaststroke and I'm, and I am timed as well. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, ma'am. That's exactly what's going to happen. Okay. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. And you, Dr. Haynes, um, I really appreciate it. You've got a great team, Dr. Smith, and, and they're handling things for the school division. They are, they're doing a great job. And uh, I'll just say that um, it's also on the board docs. And so, um, members of the public can certainly get an opportunity to go through uh, those mitigation strategies and uh, the outline in terms of all of the protocols and so forth. So it, it is available on, on board docs as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And we recognize it is a fluid document, so it will be updated like Doc Smith mentioned on a regular basis. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you again. Well, Mr. Samuels. Thank you, Chairman Kilgore. Um, so, uh, I would like to also uh, acknowledge what Ms. Um, Sherry just shared as it relates to the, the timeliness of Dr. Smith and his team uh, putting this thing on the agenda so we can have a conversation um, about this and learn about the mitigation and safety plan that is in place for our children. So kudos to Dr. Smith, kudos to Dr. Um, um, Haynes, and kudos to Beth. Uh, Ms. Mayor, yes. so I have a, a question, Ms. Mayor. Uh, as, uh, and for the swimming um, activity, you stated that uh, a, a an athlete would just swim by them by individually, and 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 their and their uh, time will be recorded. Um, um, for fairness and transparency, who will uh, who will record the time? Is it is it will, will it be a Hampton City School? employee or how, how, how does that work? That really hasn't been established yet, Mr. Samuels. However, I, I can envision that we will have coaches. And so if Beth at Mayor is going to get timed on our freestyle, then my coach is gonna be there doing the timing, whether it's the assistant coach or the, you know, the women's coach or the men's coach. Um, I think that's the only way to do it. But then again, if you have a lot of different times, you know, it's going to be tough for the coach to make it all those different times. So it's, 
it's something that they're going to um, really get together tomorrow. And I think they're gonna make some major decisions tomorrow at the athletic director's meeting and take it to the principals for final approval. But right now that's how it stands. And I, can, I really truly believe that it'll be a coach. And we're just gonna have to trust them. Exactly. And also, I just want to also acknowledge Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Smith. Um, he and I met on Tuesday for our one-to-one, um, -one, and uh, we laid this mitigation plan on the table, and we discussed it. The meeting occurred via Zoom uh, for the public uh, uh, pleasure. It, 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 it via Zoom, but he and I, we, uh, we discussed the mitigation plan in depth. Uh, I just want to acknowledge Ms. Mir uh, for making herself available um, when I had a question regarding um, one particular item that is very important to me and Dr. Smith knows this, um, the, the temperature check. Um, and, and that was discussed in detail. And I am so pleased that we will be conducting temperature checks uh, for our children and they will be also administering that, that um, screening um, via uh, prior to arriving at our facility and also during our, um, while they're on our campus. So I just wanna acknowledge um, Beth and um, her staff for making sure that those mitigation plans are in place. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Woodhouse. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation, uh, Dr. Haynes, Ms. Mayor, and uh, Dr. Smith. Um, I wanted to ask a question and I hope I asked it in the right way. Um, because of the limited amount of games that will be played uh, and they're only going to be played on the, with the teams on the peninsula, uh, what availability does the uh, college scouts have to attend, to, uh, attend some of the games that will be played so that they can scout? Many of our young people um, rely on the athletic scholarships that they receive from many of the colleges. And so there's no, there's never a definite time when scouts will come out and watch you. They have to um, work that out sometime with the coaches. And I think there's a 25 person maximum that can be in the uh, gymnasium at that time. So what, what kind of availability does scouts, scouts have to come and uh, scout our kids, you know, preparing them for the uh, of scholarships? What I would recommend to our athletic directors and our coaches is that we take an assistant coach with the video camera and I can provide them with video cameras and they can go up to the top bleacher and video the game. Um, in football we have a, and sometimes in basketball, they have a huddle system and it's a sports where, where you can just piece different, you know, things that a, a guy does or a girl does, you know, look, here's a layup or he just caught a touchdown in, in the zone. Um, so you could possibly do that. I've talked to Andy Foley and he's willing to work with me as far as maybe getting somebody up there with the video camera, Ron Baton, and maybe doing a couple games that way. But I, I think the best and the most efficient and consistent way is to have a, an assistant coach on the top of the bleacher doing a video. It's not going to be a pretty picture, but it's going to be at least something. And we do some of that now. Is that correct, Ms. Mayor? That, yes, that's yes. not out of the ordinary because for right. many of the young people with scholarships, Ms. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Jerry, you can go right ahead because you're- No, no, I, no you finish this, you finish yeah. the statement, Dr. Uh, Smith. Because in so many cases okay. now, um, uh, young people use um, uh, the video clips that we have and submit them to the colleges and universities uh, to scouts. And so that, that, is, that is something for Hampton that has been a strength uh, mm -hmm. for us. And we, and we would continue uh, to do that as a school division and to make certain that if we had to uh, take on the additional cost to make certain that we had staff members present to do that, we're gonna support our young people as it relates to uh, scholarship opportunities and so forth. Yes, and I was just gonna underscore Dr. Smith, exactly what you said. We've done that for years. Um, we, uh, Ms. Mayor and I used to call them hype tapes and the um, athletes know exactly who to get them to. The scouts know how to, how to get those. And I would imagine that we would continue along that way. I think that some of the things we were doing, Ms. Mayor, that Notre Dame was doing, correct? The yes. hype tapes and we came from that, from that perspective and Hampton has been a leader in that. Yes. Thank you. 
Great question. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Ms. Banks Gray. And I'll, I'll get to you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, fantastic presentation, Dr. Haynes and Ms. Mayor. Athlete, I can um, greatly appreciate all of the information that you uh, gave us this evening. Quick, uh, and um, a quick question. I'm a little curious, just to wonder if um, VHL is requiring a COVID-19 test for. The I'm sorry, you bro broke up. Did I? I'm sorry. I apologize. I was just wondering if a COVID-19 test is required for VHL physicals now. No, ma'am. It they is, are not. No, ma'am. Okay. Just curious. Thank you. Uh-huh. Mr. Carnahan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Mayor, I was looking at the questionnaire for, uh, or the daily screening. And um, as, you know, as a student athlete uh, myself for outdoor track, I had uh, sore muscles every day coming home from practice for the first couple of weeks while I was getting into shape. So, uh, my question is just how will student athletes be able to differentiate between uh, that kind of muscle fatigue, just normal athletic fatigue and, um, you know, a symptom of COVID-19? Because if I were in that position to take that questionnaire, um, I mean, I would have to tell the truth and answer yes, because as a part of the workout, I had fatigued muscles that were sore or, um, you know, otherwise uh, in pain. So, uh, and that, is, that is a fantastic question. And if you look at the, the disqualification on the, in, on the presentation, let's say a child does write, hey, I do have some achy muscles. So you come to practice and you know it's because you've been running. So you go to the practice and the athletic trainer is going to say, Who, hey, you answered a yes to this. And then you explain it we have it written in there that, that the athletic trainer has the authority to question your yeses. And if it is because of a different situation and not COVID related, you will be able to participate. Does that help? Yeah, I, I think I understand better now. So it's, yeah, I was, I was just concerned that it would be an instant disqualification oh. for yes, but that's not the case. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. You're welcome. And the athletic trainers really have um, the training in order to be able to distinguish between the two. And that's where you get the professional expertise that will come into play with the athletic trainer who can distinguish between the two by following up with that questionnaire in terms of asking you the specifics and so forth. So, Correct. Again, thank you, Dr. Haynes and uh, Ms. Mayor for the presentation. This time I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Smith. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board. And at this time, we'll go into the uh, business and operations, the financial report. Ms. Dorch, um, our chief financial officer, uh, will provide uh, the board with uh, information as it relates to uh, the financial report. Ms. Dorch. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, good evening, Chair Kilgore, Vice Chair Woodhouse, school board members, Dr. Smith and the Hampton community. Um, tonight is my pleasure to present the October 2020 monthly report. At the end of October, our revenues totaled $47.6 million and were 8% higher when compared to the previous fiscal year. When looking at our cumulative expenditures and encumbrances as of the end of October, the total was 75.3 million and this was approximately 2.2% higher when compared to fiscal year 20. As you can uh, recall, our average daily membership um, for the fiscal year 2021 budget was projected to be 19,030. Um, based on the fall membership report, as of September 30th, that was reported to the Virginia Department of Education, um, our fall membership was 18,762.5. Um, this is a difference of 267.5, and this information will be utilized um, by VDOE as part of the reforecast for the current school year. Um, this decrease in membership um, is expected to directly uh, impact our state funding, um, but I do want to provide some context um, just based on the information that was released 
for fall membership across the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, public K-12 fall enrollment is down by approximately over 38,000 across um, Virginia. And there was only about 13 out of the 135 divisions um, who actually reported either no change or an actual increase in fall membership. So just to provide some context on the decrease that we're seeing is pretty similar to what the Commonwealth as a whole is experiencing due to the pandemic. Um, the reforecast of the budget is expected to be released in mid-December. And as I mentioned, state revenue and state sales tax projections are anticipated to decrease um, just based on the difference in fall membership. Um, but you will remember that back in May of 2020, um, as we were developing the fiscal year 2021 budget, we did temporarily suspend some initiatives in response to the pandemic. So based on the reforecast that will be released this month, we'll do a comparison just to see a projection of how our funding um, is projected to change and compare that to the initiatives that we would temporarily suspend it. And we'll provide results of that comparison to the school board. It's part of our budget forecast presentation in January. And lastly, um, included within the report, there is a list of transfers to and from the technology classification for October. That concludes the October 2020 board report. Thank you, Ms. Dortch. Do I have any comments or questions from board members? Or yes, Mr. Karnak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very quick question. How do we have uh, half of a student in our average daily membership? Average daily membership, it is a equation that's based on um, the total um, students enrolled, but then it also looks at the attendance within um, a period of time. So the calculation can sometimes um, produce a 0. 0.5. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Smith? Mr. Chairman and members of the school, I'm sorry, Ms. Banks Gray, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think had a question. Oh, oh. Yes, I do. Really quickly, Ms. Dort. Um, you did say that reforecast will be um, completed in December uh, this month, correct? Yes, that's correct. Will that actually be released on the website as well in December? Um, yes, probably by um, December 18th, that Friday 18th. or around okay. that time. Um, they try to get the direct A templates released on the Virginia Department of Education's website. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Banks, Greg. Any other board members? All right, if not, Dr. Smith. Okay, that's it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, okay. superintendent staff reports, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to section five of our meeting, hearing of any delegations or presentations of any written communications or petitions. And as of the start of this meeting, uh, we have received none. So I will, I will move on to section six of our meeting, which is deliberation. Item 6.01 is the local plan for the education of the gifted. Is that Dr. Jones? Yes, it is. Good evening, board. It is a pleasure to present to you our plan for gifted education for the scope of 2021 to 2025. And I'm going to share my screen for our presentation. So my name is Dr. Reginald Johns and I'm the director Director of DAAE, the Department of Academic Advancement and Enrichment, which is also known as the Gifted Department here in Hampton City Schools. As you know, the Gifted Local Plan is a blueprint and it provides an explicit explanation to the community as well as to the state of our school division's implementations of the regulations governing educational services for gifted students. So as a school board member, your role is to A, um, approve <laughs> a local comprehension plan that is compliant with the regulations 
as well as to submit this local plan to VDOE so that it can receive what is called a technical review. And this is scheduled to happen every five years. So as mentioned previously, each school, school board approves the comprehension plan, and then you submit this plan for a technical review. So according to our schedule, we are to submit this by September of 2021. And so documents have been given to you so that you would have a better understanding of the components of the gifted local plan. But this presentation will tell you some of the things that the VDOE is looking for when we submit our local plan. So when we submit our local plan, it should include a definition of what we as a district consider for giftedness. It should also spe specify the areas of giftedness that our school division serves, the tools and our identification practices, how we provide professional development for teachers so that they may instruct gifted students, as well as our plan to um, provide curriculum that is suitable for gifted students? And in what way do we involve parents and community in the education of gifted children in our city? Here is a actual definition of giftedness, which reads students in public elementary, middle, secondary schools, beginning with kindergarten, all the way through 12th grade, who demonstrate high levels of accomplishment or who show potential for higher levels of accomplishment when compared to others of the same age. The aptitudes and potential for accomplishment are so outstanding that they require special programs to meet their educational needs. So our program offering is in two different areas. We have what is called GIA, general intellectual aptitude, as well as visual arts aptitude. In each case, they have program services that matriculate all the way up through 12th grade. And they also use um, services which identify students with gifted potential. Uh, they have resources that are available to provide services at different levels to meet the needs of students. And then of course, there are areas of choice where students who matriculate into high school do not have to follow one plan, but they can follow several plans um, of program services. So once a student matriculates into high school, they may choose uh, AP art courses according to their desires to continue in their artistic gifted education or if they are academically gifted, the GIA track, they do have several levels of choices where they can receive advanced instruction. And those include Governor's School for Science and Technology or IB programming, as well as AP classes or even the high school gifted enrichment cluster. So our gifted local plan does need to indicate how we are providing continuous and sequential services. And that is why we identify students from third grade all the way through 12th grade for the visual arts program and kindergarten all the way through 12th grade for our talent pool and general intellectual track. These students must also demonstrate that they have opportunities to work with their age level peers, participate in independent studies, and of course, participate in a program that fosters their intellectual growth, as well as um, demonstrate growth in their intellectual ability through various assessments. Here in Hampton City Schools for each of our programs, be a talent pool or um, GIA track or visual arts, we do use what is called multiple criteria. So there is not one of the criteria that can 
um, keep a student from being identified, we would like to look at a student holistically. And that is why we collect information from a variety of people who have interactions with these students. So some of this uh, includes interviews, collection of work samples, as well as nationally normed ability testing. But it also includes feedback from people who know the child and see giftedness and what they do every day. And that includes input from either teachers or principals or guidance counselors or their parents. We also must indicate how we provide professional development to our staff so that they may be equipped to teach gifted students. So we participate in uh, various module training as well as in-person training to provide uh, training for students or teachers who work with gifted students on a full-time level or have some gifted students within their classes. One of those things that we provide for our staff is um, endorsement training. And that is where students who, or teachers who work with students on a full-time level, uh, like at Spratly Gifted Center, uh, those administrators and teachers are required to obtain what is called the gifted add-on endorsement. And that is a series of 12 graduate classes which allowed them to receive training on the characteristics of gifted students, the social emotional needs of gifted students, how do you plan lessons that are suitable for gifted students, and then turning those lessons into a unit or a central thematic study. The gifted local plan also provides evidence of how we differentiate our curriculum. And so our local plan spells out how we do have advanced tracks for mathematics and science, how we provide opportunities for advanced placing so that students can be challenged and learn something new every day. They will have exposure to advanced content and also be challenged to participate in those higher level critical thinking activities. Our outreach with and partnership with the community is seen in our operation of a local advisory committee on gifted education. And this committee has a, a plethora of members who come from the military, businesses, parents of gifted students at various levels, as well as school personnel. And we as a group meet at least three times annually. And we review the board or review the local plan and its implementation with survey data from parents and students, as well as uh, numeric or historical data to see how our district is serving students in terms of referrals, our identification practices, as well as equitable representation. And so once we collect all that information, we of course report that to the school board and the superintendent so that you can have a more in-depth finding and understanding of how gifted operations are happening in our city. Uh, today, I did have an opportunity to speak earlier with uh, Mr. Karnak, and he had uh, several great questions in regards to how we identify students or our service models, how teachers are trained, or which teachers are serving on the um, identification committee, et cetera. And, um, I'll be happy to answer any additional questions that you may have at this time uh, as school board members. Thank you very much, Dr. Johns. Uh, do I have any comments or questions from school board members? And you may have to speak up because I can only see a few of you on the screen right now. Uh, 
Mr. Karnick, do you have any additional questions? Yeah, sure. So I'll provide a short summary of some of the uh, information that I heard in today's meeting. Again, I thank Dr. Caggiano and Dr. Johns for a productive conversation today. Uh, there was some valuable, there were some valuable insights I gained from our uh, discussion today. But uh, so looking at the, you know, the broad-based program, uh, just for public clarification, the GIA General Intellectual Aptitude uh, that is the opinion of the gifted department that it allows for more targeted acceleration for specific students and their needs uh, than does uh, specification necessarily in SAA, that specific academic aptitude, uh, those tracks. And it is my experience as well in gifted education that are that following the GIA track uh, does indeed allow for that targeted acceleration. Uh, so Let's see. One thing we talked about uh, in, in addition was uh, we, or as a division and as a gifted department, we are continuing to uh, work toward equity standards to ensure that the shares of students of particular backgrounds in the gifted program match those shares within the Hampton City Schools community, the Hampton City Schools general student population. Uh, in addition, uh, we discussed some mathematics and science acceleration opportunities within Spratly Gifted Center. Uh, that is, there will still be, uh, in addition to the two tracks that currently exist, taking either course one honors or pre-algebra in sixth grade, uh, students beginning next year will have the opportunity if uh, placed as such to take algebra one in sixth grade, but all three tracks or pathways will remain uh, extant for different students with different needs and different proficiencies. Uh, but that, the, that's all the deliberation I have uh, currently. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carney. Um, Dr. Johns, I, did, I heard you say that submittal is not required until September of next year. And Mr. Mr. Kilgore, Mr. Chairman, I stand to be corrected. I was going to make a note, a footnote right at the end of uh, the question period, that this is one report that can uh, remain um, in your sequence uh, given awesome. the timeline. So I, uh, I stand to be corrected on, on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, any, any comments or questions from board members? Since I can't really see you. All right, well, if not, Again, thank you very much, Dr. Johns. That was an excellent presentation. Lots of good stuff, so thank you. Well, I would like to say my door is always open. You. If you would like to contact me uh, directly, uh, my email, of course, is available and I'll be willing to answer any questions that you may have for our proposed local plan. Thank you very much. I, I often hear from other divisions, they're, they're really jealous about our gifted program here in Hampton because of the way we've structured it. So very proud of the work you do. Well, thank you very much, sir. All right, moving on to items for action. We have uh, seven items on the agenda this evening and I will read through those quickly and then see if anyone has any comments or wants to make a motion. They are action item 7.01, Revision of School Board Policy AC, non-discrimination. Item 7.02, Revision of School Board Policy BBA, School Board Power and Duties. Item 7.03, Revision of School Board Policy BBBC, Student Representative to the School Board. Item 7.04, Revision of School Board Policy BBFA and GBACB, Conflict of Interest and Disclosure of Economic Interest. Item 7.05, Revision of School Board Policy BDD, Electronic Participation in Meetings from Remote Locations. Item 7.06, Revision of School Board Policy CBA, Qualifications and Duties of the Superintendent. And finally, Item 7.07, .07, Revision of School Board Policy CLA, Reporting Acts of Violence and substance abuse. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve them as a block or if anyone wants to pull one out, we can do that as well. Do I have a motion? So moved, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, your motion is to approve them as a block, Dr. Woodhouse? Yes, sir. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion by Dr. Woodhouse and a second by Ms. Jackson Afanja. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Bowers, will you please call for the vote? Ms. Cherry. Aye. Dr. Mason. Aye. Mr. Samuels. Dr. Woodhouse? Aye. Ms. Afanja? Aye. Ms. Banks Gray? Aye. Mr. Kilgore? Aye. Motion carries. Our next uh, section of the meeting is information. Item 8.01 is next meetings. We have a work schedule session scheduled for December 16th at the Rupert Sargent building at 630. And our next regular meeting is scheduled for January 20th of 2021 at Jones Magnet Middle School at 630. And like Dr. Haynes uh, said about athletics, I believe we will have to remain flexible on these meetings to determine whether or not uh, based on uh, COVID numbers and governor's restrictions, whether these meetings will be virtual or not. So now we move on to uh, informational items. Um, and I will start with Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick note. Um, I, I would like to share uh, an opportunity for individuals and certainly our business community uh, to um, really uh, highlight some of the work as it relates to the uh, Hampton Education Foundation in particular and, and their focus on uh, uh, grants and, and scholarships for young people. As many of us are, are quite aware, the foundation uh, to date has really funded over $400,000 in grants. And so the majority of the dollars of the Hampton Education Foundation, they really have gone directly to support Hampton, uh, the Hampton City uh, teachers, uh, as well as uh, our, our students as we focus on uh, innovative instructional strategies and practices of the classroom, um, and also to improve uh, the classroom experience for our learners. And so we, we greatly appreciate the support that we receive. Some of the uh, past recipients have implemented projects ranging from helping first grade students publish a book of their writings and so forth, uh, to that of um, students creating robots based on works of art in a local museum. Uh, so really just to highlight some of the great and excellent work going on, the foundation has also supported the Michael Canty Memorial Scholarship um, in support of our young people and helping to provide funding for uh, young people to continue their education. And so I would say as superintendent that uh, while the pandemic has impacted our lives in so many uh, different ways. It has not changed the spirit of collective giving uh, in our community. Um, and certainly it has not impacted um, the hard work of, of, the, uh, of the foundation in support of Hampton City Schools. And so to that point, um, I would just really like to highlight uh, the fact that um, we encourage uh, certainly members of the board, but also the general community uh, to go on to their uh, Facebook page and see some of the great things that are going on and to consider ways that, uh, that we can continue to offer our support uh, for the Hampton Education Foundation, uh, whether that's the giving of our time, uh, our talents and uh, other resources as well. So we're grateful to have such a strong um, education foundation uh, in our community in support of our teachers and the teaching and the learning and certainly our young people and the families that we serve. Uh, so I wanted to highlight that and uh, know that we are all in this season of, um, of giving of our time and, and uh, sharing of our talents and, and other resources. And certainly the Hampton Education Foundation has demonstrated that they're worthy of that support as well. Thank you, Dr. Smith. They have provided years of amazing support and uh, that foundation has a lot of uh, really good people supporting it. So thank you for that information. Um, just real quickly, 
because I don't want to miss an opportunity to brag on the superintendent and his team. Um, the superintendent uh, and his team were selected to present uh, the early bird session at the Virginia School Board Association annual conference this year. The, uh, they presented the student achievement uh, and success during times of uncertainty uh, it was Dr. Smith, Ms. Hatcher, Ms. Maxlow, Ms. Peterson, and Dr. Caggiano. They did an amazing job. Um, I, I know several of the board members got to attend it and during the breakout sessions. It was great to hear from other divisions around the state and just how impressed they were with the information um, and how they just wanted more and more. Um, but uh, it was an excellent, excellent presentation. So wanted to congratulate you on that. Um, and then the other thing that happened at our Virginia, our annual conference for the Virginia School Board Association was our very own student representative, Paul Karnak, was awarded the VSBA Exhibitors Scholarship. And so uh, one of, we've got 132 divisions in the state of Virginia and he was one of two selected for the scholarship. So congratulations to Paul Carnack. Do I have any other informational items from board members? Yes, Ms. Cherry. Yes, um, and ditto for um, the outstanding presentation made by Dr. Smith and his team and the um, award for Mr. Karnak. I immediately um, text him and a couple other board members started texting the congratulations as Banks Gray and others did as well. But I just have two quick comments. One actually is a question, an informational question, I guess. And the other one is a comment. Um, on the consent agenda, we, we approved the minutes of the governance training of November 10th, 2020, where Ms. Gina Patterson and Samantha were there to um, guide the board. And we have not been able to, as Ms. Patterson had suggested, have a follow-up meeting so the board could move forward. And I just wanted to just put into the a chair's mind, at least, that um, we might want to go ahead and have that because we don't want them to feel that it was a waste of their time coming because they really had to jump through some hoops to accommodate us. And, and I think all of us appreciate that. So whenever we can have that would, would be great. The okay. second thing is um, a comment. And I know um, often we reside on, <clears throat> people can reside on different sides of the track or um, di different viewpoints um, in different places. But I think when we find something that is unique, that is outstanding, then we need to give kudos to it. We need to be men enough or women enough to give kudos to others. And with that, I'd like to give kudos to the chair, <clears throat> excuse me, to the chair of the Newport News School Board, uh, Mr. Douglas Brown. I was able to witness a couple of weeks ago how he handled a meeting wherein the superintendent was given his um, return to school plan. And Mr. Brown not only spoke to board members about expressing concerns or questions from teachers, but he encouraged that they do that. And he himself ended by saying, and I have one question that has come from a teacher as well. So I think when you see that kind of leadership that digs down and sees that our teachers, um, we have to honor them and honor their questions, honor their concerns, that really hit home with me. So even though he's on a different side of track, he's Newport News and we're Hampton, I think we're all in this together and I just want to give kudos. Thank you. Yes. Any other comments? Yes, Mr. Samuels. Uh, this is, uh, uh, Dr. Smith mentioned, in, in the spirit of sharing your talents and your resources, I know Dr. Smith and his staff, Ms. Pat Ms. Thatcher and, 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 and Dr. Haynes, I still see him up here, and Dr. Caggiano, I know you guys are very humble individuals, but you are great leaders. And I just want to share with the community that uh, these individuals have authored a book um, about the work that they have done in Hampton City School and was presented at VSBA uh, um, annual meeting. And so if you would be so kind to go ahead and purchase this book and share this book with your loved ones and or teachers, that would be greatly appreciated. So I just want to put that out there. And that money also goes back to Hampton City Schools. So 
in, in the spirit of giving, I want you to purchase their book. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Samuels. Any other informational item from board members or from our student representative? Yes, Mr. Carnett. Yes, yeah, so I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, spotlight some of our outstanding seniors uh, right now. Uh, and no, it's not just because I'm a senior, but uh, because uh, right now is the thick of college application season and several of our seniors have applied early action or early decision to some institutions of higher learning throughout Virginia and throughout the nation. And uh, they have received their decisions. A lot of them have gotten into great schools and, you know, even more of our seniors are still in the process of applying to college. So I'd like to offer a note of motivation and say that uh, with many deadlines for many uh, institutions coming up in January, the race is almost run. So uh, there is obviously, uh, I think the, you know, for many seniors, myself included, it's, it's right to say that the, uh, the image of uh, college admissions is coming into focus and the finish line is coming into focus. So uh, do not give up. Uh, we are almost there uh, together as seniors. Uh, we are we are almost in that stage where they will come to us about uh, you know our dreams and our work will be done and just the waiting game will begin. Uh, so our part is almost finished. Keep at it and uh, keep doing you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carnett. All right, without further ado, uh, not keeping anybody away from football games, everybody have a great evening and uh, safe. be safe and this meeting is adjourned.